they started developing their own currency in 2014, uh, but it was really Facebook's announcement that got everyone sort of really excited and, and interested in moving faster in this space. Mm -hmm. And now what you have is, I think, a lot of central banks feel like if they don't do it, they might be left behind. Mm -hmm. Some view digital currency adoption as a race between public and private markets, but the reality is that forms of both will ultimately coexist. In order to understand what that scenario looks like, I spoke to Neha Narula, Research Director of Digital Currency at the MIT Media Lab, who deliberately spends as much time researching central bank digital currencies as she does stablecoins like Bitcoin. Neha, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us uh, this afternoon. Um, now, I wanted to talk specifically to you about um, central bank digital currencies uh, and private market currencies, but before we do that, would you mind just introducing yourself and saying a little bit about your background? Sure. So uh, my name is Neha Narula. I'm the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, which is based out of the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, we're a group of technologists uh, and researchers who are focusing on cryptocurrency and digital currency research and development. So uh, when you say do research on, are you you're working with central banks to help them design a digital currency? Is that right? Yeah, so we actually work in two areas. One area is in cryptocurrencies, where we focus on decentralized networks. And then the other area is centralized digital currency. And uh, well, who has the biggest uh, cur centralized currencies out there? It's central banks. Um, mm -hmm. And they are starting to investigate the idea of issuing their own digital currency. Uh, and so we've had the pleasure of working with a few different central banks. Uh, and more recently, we've been doing a project in the past year with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. In terms of rollout of a central bank digital currency, um, uh, I think you'll probably agree with me that it's inevitable that they will at least try at some point. Mm -hmm. um, however, my question to you is, uh, why don't central banks just kind of wait and let the private market make the mistakes? I mean. With all your amazing research, I'm sure they'll get it right. But um, you know, they could for free just wait and let the private market work out where the mistakes lie, and then you know, wait a few years and then produce one that's much better. Because I assume that when central banks release a digital currency, they want to make sure that it's it's right. It's a good yeah, one. there's a lot of pressure. <laughs> there's a yeah. lot of pressure to get it right. <laughs> well, sorry. Let me I, let me ask you a, a follow up quickly. Is that are they under pressure because? Basically, the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum are just getting so big that had they stayed at you know, lower numbers with market caps around 10, 20 billion, uh, they wouldn't have been in such a rush. But because of the attention these coins and uh, this, this technology is getting, they feel that they're, they need to be there faster. Yeah, so interestingly, it's not actually Bitcoin and Ethereum that are putting the pressure on central right. banks, despite the fact that I think today crypto has a market cap around $3 trillion. That's peanuts to a central bank. Right. The real pressure is coming from uh, tech companies like Facebook. So when Facebook announced that they were interested in developing a digital currency in 2018, that is what really woke a lot of central banks up because Facebook has 3 billion users. That is more than any country in the world. That is huge reach. And the idea that they might be able to launch their own currency, which would be instantly available to all 3 billion users, that was a real wake-up call for central banks. In particular, it was a wake-up call for the uh, People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of China. They started developing their own currency in 2014, uh, but it was really Facebook's announcement that got everyone sort of really excited and, and interested in moving faster in this space. Mm -hmm. And now what you have is I think a lot of central banks feel like if they don't do it, they might be left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, so why yeah. didn't that work? Why didn't what work? Uh, was it Libra? Was Facebook's currency? Yes. So it I'm might... assuming it's about who owns the data or... Yeah, so Facebook's currency, Libra, now Diem, mm -hmm. might work. It just oh, okay. hasn't launched yet. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of, they're, they're really taking, taking it slow. Uh, they've committed to wanting to do it, you know, very safely through um, proper regulatory means. Um, and so, you know, they're spending a lot of time working on it, trying to get it right. Uh, that means the launch has been a bit delayed. I think it's going to be an interesting question to see what does actually launch. Mm -hmm. They started out saying that they were going to launch their own currency, and now they've scaled that back to launching something that's more like a digital dollar. 
Um, so we, yeah, we kind of have to wait and see what happens. And you know, I keep calling it Facebook's currency, and you call it Facebook's currency as yeah. well. And I think most people do. Um, you know, they 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 call it Diem, and there's an organization called the Diem Association, which is supposed to be governing it. But you know, I think Facebook is really the dominant player here. So. When it comes to the central banks rolling out digital currencies, what power do they have, if any, to now think, right, we're going to be less accommodating about other coins and, and the private markets? And, you know, to some extent, we'll be able to slightly usher them out. Or do our central banks, in your opinion, going to be fine with, you know, people having the option of using whatever coin they, they want? Well, I think that, you know, there's what central banks want and what the regulators and governments can enforce. And then there's what people want. So technology is kind of inevitable. It's really hard to stop a snowball rolling down a mountain. And so we've seen this in, in plenty of areas uh, in, in, in tech and where tech is run up against regulation and government. And uh, if people are really using something and finding value in it, then the regulation has to change. You can't change people finding value in something. So an example of this is Uber. Uh, you know, Uber pretty flagrantly uh, flouted <laughs> regulations to start their company and to start their business. And, uh, you know, um, as people kind of tried to put a lid on that, they were really challenged. They were challenged politically. Yeah. Uh, you know, Uber took out advertisements saying, you know, your politicians are trying to take this service away from you and people didn't like it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you can think about that analogy extending to money. Right. Um, so it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. And it, it, I think it really depends on where we see useful systems being built, useful applications that really make people's lives better. So um, could you help me understand the issue of privacy a bit better? Because I do feel there's a lot of misconception here uh, and help, maybe you can help explain it to me, uh, that in the future we may use one digital currency to you know, buy on Amazon or whatever because we don't mind if we see our footprint you know, out there for people to see, but we may um, donate to a political party, we may want to remain more anonymous using that, and that would be a different digital currency. Is that a, is that a, a possibility that we may face? Yeah, so I'm a computer scientist, I'm a systems researcher, uh, and we try to build secure private systems. And it is extremely challenging. It is really, really challenging to get strong privacy in these systems. However, I think it's of paramount importance. Can you go into a bit more detail about that? Like, Why is it so difficult to to build in. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the way to think about this is once information is out there, it's out there. Mm. Uh, and it's very hard to take it back. And so you really have to think about privacy very early on in a system. And it is so much easier to build privacy in from the beginning than to try to tack it on later. Uh, you know, that's another thing. And, and uh, what we've seen is that the momentum is often in the direction of uh, you know, revealing more and more and more data. It's always easier to kind of reveal a little bit more data. It's always harder mm -hmm. to keep more data secret as time goes on. So this is a really challenging area. Um, and I think, you know, just given all of the prevalence of technology in our lives, we've gotten kind of used to companies collecting a lot of our data. Uh, what we're starting to run into is that that might not be a great idea, that, that you know, we are kind of giving up agency to our own data. With money, we have the opportunity to design that right from the beginning. Because we're designing these new digital currencies, we can think about privacy at the very start. We can think about how to build that in. And uh, we take a lot of inspiration from the cryptocurrency world where we see these privacy-preserving cryptocurrencies, uh, Zcash and Monero being two of the biggest right. ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I think a few years ago there was uh, some resistance about, you know, cryptocurrencies or digital assets being able to use for crime or, or you know, for more black market uh, sales or so. But that seems to have dissipated as people understand more that it's more that you can be held accountable if, uh, if someone wanted to find out about a transaction they could. But what are, the, some of the, um, what are the, some of the issues where you're seeing resistance from people keen to adopt these kind of assets? Yeah, there's a lot of resistance. Some of it is well-founded. I, I want to make that clear. Um, but some of it isn't. I think that there is this misconception that the only use for cryptocurrencies is in crime. And as far as I can tell, the data just doesn't bear that out. That's right. not true. It's actually a very, very small percentage that's used in criminal activity. And uh, I think the thing that's really important to note is that if you build a payment system, it will be used for crime in some way. There's yeah. no way to get zero crime. That's right. impossible. Um, you know, but you try you try to, to build it in such a way that, that you can reduce that amount. 
and I think, you know, also if you look at the existing regimes we have today uh, in the regulatory space for how we address this risk, um, it involves identifying people and it involves collecting a whole lot of data uh, and it really puts the risk in a place where it's the incentive of the bank or the payment service provider to collect a ton of data and to flag anything at all that might even look slightly risky. Yeah. And so you end up with things like, um, you know, I hear all these stories about people who uh, pay, uh, you know, might pay a relative in another in another country once a month, and every single time that gets flagged yeah. as as a you know possibly fraudulent transaction, or people who. Um, you know, are uh, buying something for the first time from a new merchant. Mm -hmm. um, that merchant doesn't have a lot of history. Their funds get frozen, you know, and they don't have access to their funds for 30 days. Yeah. So the systems we have right now just aren't efficient. They aren't doing as good a job as they could. And we have the opportunity to redesign them from right. the ground up right. using things like cryptography and verifiability. Now, you mentioned just now that you said some of the reservations that you see today are warranted. Could you mention some of those? Yeah, so I think um, something that maybe people don't think about enough is the technology risk behind some of these uh, behind some of these cryptocurrencies and digital payment platforms. So I want to make it clear I'm I think this te technology is incredible. I think it's right. going to change the world. It already is changing the world. However, that said, it is brand new technology. Right. So Bitcoin has been around the longest um, for about 12 years. And a lot of people like to say, well, it's never been hacked. It's never been hacked and it's out there. And uh, you know, obviously, if, if someone, you know, someone would hack it if they could. And I, I just don't think that's that's exactly true. I right. think that um, these systems actually, you know, there's a lot of different dynamics going on. and um, you know, we're still learning how to secure them effectively. That's a lot of the research that my group works on. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to the developers of these systems, you know, they they use words like, well, this is still an experiment and we're still building. We're in the early stages where, you know, there's going to be problems, but we're going to find them and we're going to fix them. Right. But then you talk to some of the investors and they're using words like, well, this is hardened. You know, this is mm. this is government proof. This is this is hack proof. This is totally secure. And so there's we've noticed this divide <laughs> between the developers and the investors, which is fine. I mean, it's a new technology, but I just think, you know, people need to be able to understand that risk and price it appropriately. So are you surprised that um, a currency like Bitcoin hasn't been hacked yet? Uh, yeah, I am kind of surprised, actually. Um, you know, there's been some... Sounds like if anyone could do it, you could. Uh, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> but but I, I, I think I do know people in the world who could. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of them don't because they don't want to. They yeah. want Bitcoin to succeed. Yeah. Well, that's the difference is there's a lot of people who, you know, see this as the future and they want this to succeed because they can see all the benefits attributed to it. But... Exactly. But, I mean, I think, you know, we, we want this to work even in the most adversarial of cases. Yeah. So. Uh, it's going to take a little bit more time and, and research effort to really, really get the foundation secure. Um, so if you don't mind me asking a kind of a crystal ball question, if you looked out five years to 2026, what do you think the world of uh, currencies and digital asset looks like then, roughly speaking? And what are the sort of issues we'll be talking about, do you think? Yeah, well, it's, it's so hard to predict because the last five years have been so surprising. Right. It, everything has just accelerated so much faster than I ever thought it would. So 2026, I think that gives some central banks enough time, some major central banks enough time to launch their own currency. So I think we see a top six uh, Including currency. Including the dollar? Uh, I, I don't know if it'll be the dollar, but I think we'll see at least one top six. <laughs> We're not going to hold you to this. Uh, at least one of them uh, has launched a, a digital currency. I think that uh, the cryptocurrency space is going to be bigger than ever. Yeah. Um, and you know, just like with uh, with you know, we've seen these use cases come up that were a little bit surprising but really exciting and took the world by a storm. DeFi, NFTs, we're going to see even more of those. So, you know, we're going to see new business models built on top of these cryptocurrency platforms. I also think we might see a much smaller number of cryptocurrencies. I think the space that's is going to is going to winnow a little bit, whether yeah. that's due to regulation or hacks or, you know, whatever might happen. Well, Neha, I feel like I've talked to you for hours and hours and thank you so much for spending yeah. the time chatting us today and uh, I hope we get to chat again in the future. Yeah, that was great. Thank yeah, you thanks, very Jamie. much. <laughs> the debate is over as to whether digital currencies will be a part of our lives or not. They emphatically will be. The question is how and when will they be adopted and who will win between the private and public markets? Is there room for both? Well, the race is on 
and the winner is likely to appear in the next few years. And that's why it's crucial to be learning about this now. If you'd like to read more on this topic, please go to footsierussell.com forward slash research where you'll find much more information.